Hi again, this is Jeff, your ProtoPy expert, answering your ProtoPy questions. Today's question comes from Andre. Andre asks, I don't know how I can prototype text fields with different states and validate what has been entered into those fields. Okay, I'm going to show you how to do this. In my Pi here, I have what appears to be the last step in some kind of a registration process. And this is the point where you're asked to opt into an email list. And if I preview this, this is a working checkbox already. And essentially what this does is just changes the opacity on that check icon. So when I click on this, if we just take a look at the, when I tap on the checkbox group here, it takes a look at the opacity of the check icon. If the opacity is zero, it changes it to 100. And if the opacity is 100, it changes it to zero. That's all it does. So this currently works. And essentially what I want to happen is when I check this, I want this text field, which is currently in a disabled state, I want that to become enabled looking. That'll be the second state. And uh, when we focus it, it's gonna have a third state, a focus state. And then lastly, when we click the submit button, it's gonna validate what's been entered in there to make sure that it's a valid email address. I'm gonna show you how to do all of that. So now let's go back to our, our pie here. Now the first thing we need to do is our text field is in a disabled state, but you can't actually make a disabled text box in ProtoPie. So even though I've got the opacity reduced to make it look disabled, I can still tap it and the keyboard comes up. So what we'd like to do is make it so that way when you tap it, nothing happens until it becomes enabled. So in order to make it enabled, what I normally like to do is draw a box just over top, just like this. And the key part here is you want to make sure that this make lower layers untouchable is unchecked. If I leave that checked, you're going to see that I can bring up the keyboard there. But if I turn that off, that makes sure that the event can't pass through it. So if I tap on that, you're going to see it's not focusing that input field. And of course, the second thing I want to do is I want to make this look invisible. And you might think to do that, I could just take the opacity down to zero. Uh, you're going to see that doesn't work. So when I tap on here, it's bringing up my keyboard again. Whenever you make something opacity zero, it becomes completely invisible as if it doesn't even exist. So in order for this make lower layers touchable to block the event going through, it needs to be opacity of something other than zero. So I'm gonna turn it back up to 100, but in order to make this box invisible, I'm just gonna remove its fill. And I can do that by clicking the checkbox here. And you're gonna see now it's invisible, but because the opacity is 100%, it's still there. And then when I preview this and I click on that input field, you're gonna see I can't focus it now, which is great. Now what I wanna do is I wanna make it such that it becomes available and focusable when I click this checkbox. So let's use a detect trigger on this. What I want to do is I wanna detect when the opacity of that check icon changes. So we're gonna choose detect and we're gonna say the check icon and I care about its opacity. And any time the opacity of that check icon changes, this detect will fire. And let's put two conditions in here. The first condition is when the check icon's opacity is 100, or essentially when it's checked. So we can call this condition checked. And I'm going to make another one. And this will be for when the opacity of the check icon is 0, or when it's unchecked. We'll call this unchecked. And what we can do is make some changes. So when it is checked, the first thing I wanna do is I wanna remove that mask. So we're going to, let's name the mask first of all. So we called it rectangle one, let's call this input mask. So we know what it's there for. And what I'd like to do is I'm now going to change the opacity of that input mask. You remember what I told you before, that when you take the opacity all the way down to zero, it becomes as if it doesn't even exist. So you're gonna see that if I preview this right now, right now I can't check it, but if I click this checkbox, now I can. So we've done that. The opacity of the mask we've made zero. Then we want to bring the opacity of the email input field. It's currently at 15. We want to bring that up to 100. So let's add an opacity response in here of the email input field. Make that 100. Opacity inputs 100. And if I check it again, then I want to reverse that. So we're gonna take our, let's copy these. So I've held down shift by the way, selected them both, and then command C or control C on Windows, Check, uh, click on this condition, command V or control V on Windows, and I'm gonna paste these as my starting point, and then I'm just gonna modify them. So I'm gonna put the mask back up to 100, and let's rename this. 
and I'm going to take the input back down to 15. Now what I should have is my input field. There we go. So when I check, it becomes enabled, and I can raise the keyboard on it. And if I uncheck it, it becomes disabled, and I can't raise it again. So we've got it checked, and we can put some text in there, for example. Uh, if I uncheck it, though, the text I wrote in there stays. And I think that's kind of weird. So I, I think what I want to do is actually clear the text field when I uncheck this. So let's add a response here. Let's add a text response, and this will be the email input. And um, you might think that I could just leave this blank and this would give me putting no text in that box, but that doesn't work in Protopy like that. You have to use a formula for it. And in order for it to assign uh, essentially no text in there, you have to give it what's called an empty string. And that is two quote symbols in your formula. So now when I preview this, I will enable it and I'm gonna put some text in there. Now I'm gonna disable it. All right, so it kind of worked, but you're gonna notice that it, it disabled and it removed that text a bit too quickly. It didn't look quite natural. So when, when I put that in there, you're gonna see the placeholder comes back before it's fully disabled. We can, dis, we can delay the removal of the text on the timeline here. And I'm just gonna move when this happens to the end of these animations. And now when I preview this, I can check it. I can put some text in there. And if I uncheck it, there we go. That looks pretty good. Now, so we've got two states for our text field. We've got disabled, we've got enabled. Let's give it a third state. Let's give it a focus state. So let's change the, the border color of the text field when we focus it. And we can use the focus trigger for this. So there is a focus trigger and you have two options. Here, let me choose that on the input. I want the email input field. You can have focus in and that's when it gets focus and, that's, uh, and then focus out is for when it loses focus. And we're gonna use both of these. We're gonna start with the focus in. And I will just rename this, we'll call it focus in. And I would like to change the color of the border on that input field. So I'm already selected there. I don't wanna change the text color. I wanna change the border color. And let's give it this purple color here to match the submit button. And then similarly, I'd like it to go back to that gray color when it loses focus. So let's duplicate this. And if I take this trigger and I hit command D or control D on windows, it will duplicate that trigger. And let's modify it. So in this case, I don't want focus in, but I want focus out. And I'll rename this to be focus out. And we're going to change our color to be that gray one again, which is this one here. So now I should have three states for my input field. I've got disabled, and I can't do anything with it. I've got enabled, which happens when I check it. And I have a focus state. And you'll notice the border change to be purple to indicate that it's focused. And if I click off, it goes back to gray. Purple, gray, there we go. So now we have, uh, we've prototyped a, an input field with three different states. Now let's validate what has been entered in here, right? What we want to do is we're gonna do, it won't be the most robust email validation. It's for demonstration purposes. And there are ways that we'll be able to break it and get false positives or you know the, the wrong validation, but it will be good enough to explain what we're trying to do here. Uh, what we'd like to do is an email address is in the format of something at something dot something. So what we want to do is we're going to validate to make sure that something has been entered into the field. First of all, it's not empty. Uh, then we're going to validate that there is an at symbol that is not in the first position. Then we're going to validate that there is a dot symbol that is after at least one character after, or at least two characters after the at symbol, and that the dot symbol is not at the end. This is how we're gonna validate our, our email. So how might we do that? What we're gonna do is we're gonna do it on the submit click here. So I'm gonna add a tap trigger for the submit button. Now the first thing I'm gonna do for this tap is I'm gonna change the opacity of the error message. So let's go to here. We go error message and we'll change the opacity to 100. And um, you're gonna understand in a second why I'm doing this. But basically, if my validation fails, then this line will uh, effectively take precedence. And you might think, well, doesn't that mean the error message will show up anytime you hit that submit button? Technically, yes but we're gonna have a way to actually suppress that so it doesn't happen when our validation passes. But you're gonna see, when I click that submit button, here, let me reset it there. When I click the submit button, my error message showed up. 
So the first thing I want to validate for is if I haven't checked this this checkbox, if I if I've left it unchecked, I should be able to just go on to the uh, to scene two. So let's put that validation in first. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to add a condition, and if the check icon's opacity is zero, then we are going to jump to scene two. And let's give it a transition. I like this slide in. All right, so now we should be able to jump to scene two. And if I hit submit, it took me over to scene two. Um, now, it went a little bit quick, but um, what you wouldn't have noticed is that error message would have shown as we're going over there. And if this went a little bit slower, you might have seen that error message. So for example, let me move the, the jump out a little bit to after when the error message is supposed to show. So I want to preview this. And if I hit submit, you're going to see I saw the error message and then it's jumping over to the next scene. What we want to do is we want to, instead of allowing that error message to show, we actually want to override this. And this is something of how Protopy intrinsically works. If I copy this opacity, so Command C, and I'm gonna paste it into my condition here and change it. So it's opacity zero. And let's take off the animation. I'll make it happen immediately. So I'm setting the duration to zero. When you have multiple um, of the same responses on the same object happening at the same time, the one that's lower down will take precedence. But because this is under a condition, this can only happen if this condition is true. So if this condition is true, this overrides this. But if this condition is false, this will run. There's nothing to override it. So now, here, let's put our jump, we'll put it back out a little bit so we can see it happening. Now, if I hit submit, there, my jump happened and my error message didn't show. And that's gonna form the basis of how we do um, our logic here. So by default, we're going to show that error message unless we can satisfy a condition, and in which case we'll override that showing the error message and jump to scene two. So that is if it's unchecked. But if it is checked, my validation gets a bit more complicated. So let's add another condition. And this will be for when it is checked. So we'll take the check icons opacity. And this is the case where when it's 100. And when this passes validation, obviously we care more about when it's checked. We want the same thing to happen here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy these two and paste it under here. And obviously if you're following along, you're gonna think, well, it's gonna go no matter what. And you are right at the moment. So if I check this and I hit submit, it is going to seem to, because we haven't added any more validation into here. Right now, all we've checked for is if that icon is checked. Um, so let's add our next bit of validation. We want to make sure that something has been entered into this field, at least one character. So how are we going to do that? Now, if you go over to Protopie's website, there is this Learn tab. And if you go to Documentation, and if you go to Formulas, you're going to see there's this thing called Functions here. And there's a bunch of built-in functions that you can use to make better logic in your Pies. We're going to be using the length function and the index of function for our validation here. So the first thing we're gonna do is we are going to use the length function to find out how long the text that's been input in there. If it's zero, that means nothing has been put in there. If I've, put, if I've typed three characters, it, this would give me the number three. But if you type number, uh, nothing in there, you'll get the number zero. And if it's zero, then I want to prevent moving on to the next scene and I wanna show that error message. So let's go back to our pie. Okay, so we have one condition, we have one test so far in our condition. Let's add another one. And you can add multiple tests in your condition by clicking this plus right here. So if I, I care that, uh, I wanna do a formula here, and I am going to use the length function. And I care about the length of the text that's been that's been typed into this input field. So what I want to do is I want to start with getting that input field's layer name. And I can do that just by hitting the plus here. And I'm going to choose email input. And that will give you the layer itself. But I care about one of its properties. If you hit then dot, it will give you a list of all of the properties available here. And we care about text. And you need to close the brackets to complete the function. So this will give me a number. 
and I care that this number is greater than zero. If it's zero, then it, it fails our validation and it will not allow us to go on there. So we are going to choose greater than and the value zero. So now we should have a very simple validation at this point. And if I check this and I just hit submit, you're gonna see, please enter a valid email address because I put nothing in there. And then if I go here and then I type something, then it now goes to scene two. So that's working. Now, another thing you'll notice here that, okay, so it's failed my validation. When I tap back into the field and I wanna fix it, what I wanna do is I actually wanna hide this error message. So that way, if there's an error, the next time I hit submit, it's gonna come back. So it's not gonna say stagnant on there. So let's copy our error message opacity. This is the one for zero. Let's copy that and let's put it under our uh, focus in trigger. And this will be animated. So let's make it 0 0.2 again. And also, so now if I check on here and hit submit, now when I click on there, the error message goes away. And then if I click submit again, it comes back. But I also want to get rid of that error message if I just uncheck this, because now there's, it's no error. This is perfectly valid. So let's also copy this one and we'll put it under our detect when we're unchecked, we'll put it here. All right, so I uncheck it, my field becomes active. And if I click submit, I get the error message. If I focus back, the error message goes away. I click submit again, error message comes back. I uncheck this, my error message goes away. Great, so that is working and we have very simple validation here. I gotta type something in here. So if I just type the letter H, for example, it passes our validation, takes us on to the next scene. Okay, let's make this even more robust. Let's test for the presence of the at symbol. Remember I showed you the other function we're gonna use is the index of function. And this allows us to, we take a piece of text, which is the source, and I'm gonna search for the presence of another bit of text within there. If it exists, it's going to give me a number that indicates its position. If it doesn't exist, it will give me negative one. So if an at symbol doesn't exist, I will get negative one. If it does exist, I will get a number. Now you, you might look at this and be like, okay, why am I getting a zero here? The word hello is in the first spot here. Therefore I would expect this to be one. So interesting thing about computers is they start counting from zero. So even though we have, um, I don't know, it's uh, 11 characters, five space five. So it's 11 characters uh, is the length. The first character is zero. So zero, one, two, three, four. So the first character is zero, second character is one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, let's test for the presence of the at symbol, first of all. So we'll go back to our condition here. Let's add another one down here and we're gonna use a formula again. And we'll use index of, and it's important that you match the case. So it's a capital O, you're gonna see it was a capital O here in index of. If you use lowercase, it's not gonna work. So you gotta make sure you match the case. Index of, and our first parameter is the text we want to search within, and that is the, oops, not the input mask. I should remove that. Not the input mask, but the email input, and we want the text property of it and we do a comma to separate one parameter from the next. And now we're gonna put in a little bit of text to say what we wanna search for. And I wanna search for the at symbol. And you surround it with quotes because this means text. And I'll use a bracket to close that and I'll say okay. So what I want to test to make sure, you recall that if it doesn't exist, it's going to give me negative one. So I want to make sure that it does not equal negative one. Now let's preview this. I'm gonna check this, my field is enabled. Let's type something in here. It doesn't like it. And if I put an at symbol, okay, so it's now passing my validation, my more stringent validation. Um, let's make this a little bit more, a little bit more robust though. Um, an email address can't, can't start with an at symbol. It's gotta have something before the at symbol. So we also care that the at symbol is not in the first position, or if you recall, position zero. So what we can do is we can make another one like this. We can make another test within our condition, and we're gonna get a formula. 
And I can copy this again because I am looking for the index of that at symbol. So we say, okay. And I can paste it here in this formula box. And I care that it's not zero. So I can say does not equal zero. And this should now work. So I'm gonna check this, type in something that fails. And if I put in at symbol at the beginning, that should also fail. There we go. And if I type something in front of that, that passes. Okay, we're getting there. Um, now you'll notice that these two tests look pretty much the same. And we can simplify this so they're all done in one. So if it doesn't exist, I get negative one. If it's in the first position, it's zero. If it's in any other position, I'm gonna get a number greater than zero. So all I care is that the position of the at symbol is in a position greater than zero. If it doesn't exist, that's negative one. If it's in the first position, that's zero. So one, two, three, four, they're all valid. So instead of having two tests here, we can do one. And instead of saying does not equal negative one, I wanna say greater than zero. Anything greater than zero, uh, is valid. If it doesn't exist, negative one, negative one is less than zero, uh, then therefore this will fail. And if it's in the very first position, that's position zero, zero is not greater than zero and therefore it fails. So anything greater than zero will pass. Okay, let's preview that. I'm gonna enable this and we'll put in, so if we put in at, well actually let's do it first of all with just whatever, that should fail. Let's put in our at symbol at the front. That also fails. And if we put something in front of that, that passed. Okay, good, we're almost there. Let's now test for a dot character. And once again, we're going to use the index of, but this time, instead of it being greater than equal to a value, what we want it to be is greater than the position of the at symbol. So let's add another test here. And we will use formula. And in our formula, we are going to use index of, and once again, I care about the email inputs text property, and I'm looking for the dot character this time. And I don't know exactly what position is that I need to compare it against. I need to find the position of the at symbol and then use that for my comparison. So you can also use a formula in the value that you want to compare it against. So I'm going to use a formula down here. And I'm going to say index of, and like we did before, email inputs text property. And in this case, I want to know where the at symbol is. And I want it to be greater than the than one more than the at symbol. So as long as, so if my at symbol is in position three, then position four for the dots no good, position five and above is fine. So what I want is I want this to be greater than the index of email inputs text where the at symbol is plus one. So if it's greater than one character after the at symbol, we're good. All right, so let's preview this. Enter my email address, so we'll do, make this Jeff at AOL. And this should fail because there's no dot. So I'm gonna submit that. And if I do this and I put a dot right here, this should also fail. So now, if I put a dot here, this should pass. Okay. We're almost there, but the last thing I want to do is I wanna test and I wanna make sure that the dot is not the last character that's been typed in. So if I did Jeff at AOL dot and I hit submit, this is gonna pass because currently our rules are looking for the position of the dot being after the at character, but we haven't stipulated that it can't be the last character. So if I hit the submit, that passed. So let's add our final test in our validation here. So I'm gonna hit plus. And again, I want a, I want to use a formula. And I'm gonna copy this formula right here. And let's paste it in this formula box. So now I'm finding the position of the dot character. And I care that it's not the last character. So I'm going to use a formula again because I need to calculate what the last character is and I don't know what's been typed at this point. 
Once again, we're going to use the length function here. So the length of email input, the text property, and the last character is length minus one. Remember what I said about computers starting to count from zero. So if you have a, a phrase that's five characters long, the length function will say that that's five characters, but the last character is position four because the first one is position zero. Zero, one, two, three, four. So position five is actually position four. So I want to make sure that the dot is less than, the position of the dot is less than the last character in there. So now if I preview this again, this should now be my complete validation. So I can say check, enter my email address. So Jeff at AOL, this would have failed, or sorry, this would have passed before. I'm gonna hit submit, it didn't like that. But if we add dot com, that passed. So let's go through and test all our validation again. So if I put in, if I leave this unchecked, this should pass. Great. If I check this, this should fail and it fails. If I put in something in here, but there's no at character, it fails. If I put in an at character as the first one, it fails. If I put something in the front, but I don't have a dot after there, that should fail. And if, if I put a dot immediately after the at character, that should fail. And if my dot is instead at the end, that should fail as well. But if I add something to the end on here, so now I have something at something dot something, this passes. There we go, that's our validation done. Now, this is not the most robust validation in here. And in fact, we can easily break this if let's say I did jeff.clark at aol.com. This is a perfectly valid email address, uh, but because our logic says we expect a dot to be after the at symbol, the way index of works is this will give you the first instance of here. So the index of is actually gonna give us the uh, the first inst the position of the first dot. It, don't, it won't give us the position of the second dot. In order to validate something like this, uh, it, it's a little bit more complicated. It can be done with protopy. If you are interested in seeing that done, maybe leave a comment in there and uh, I can go through doing a bit more of a robust email validation uh, in here. So there you go, easy as pie. It's a very complicated subject and we've used a lot of new things that uh, we might not have um, talked about before. In particular, we use some of these text functions. So index of, uh, the length function. Otherwise, if you run into uh, a problem with one of your pies and you'd like to ask us for help, just check out the link in the description below. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.